Hey guys, Steve here, and last time we trekked through Pokemon Blue with Bumblebee the Beedrill. Beedrill landed itself in the B tier of my list seen here with the final time of 134 real time, 601 game time, at level 59 with 7 resets. This run is going to be Kangaskhan. Yes, that's right, everyone's favorite difficult to catch Safari Zone Pokemon. Kangaskhan has base stats totaling 430 with only one weakness in fighting types. There aren't a whole lot of these moves, so it's quite a bonus. Kangaskhan surprisingly doesn't see a lot of play, thanks to its low catch rate and being walled off by the Safari Zone. 95 attack and 90 speed means I will get to go first quite often, and with moves like Body Slam and Earthquake, I will get the one shot most Pokemon. The learn set is quite strong too, as Kangaskhan gets the lion's share of good moves and has to choose which ones to use and when. As always, my solo runs will be using the Gen 1 Blue version with the Pokemon selected from the comment section of the previous video. If there aren't enough comments, I'll be using a Pokemon selected at random. I'll be playing with the same rules as I always do. I will only be allowed to use one Pokemon. The other Pokemon will be used for HM purposes only and not be used in battle. No glitches or exploits except for the badge boost glitch and Marowak skip. No items used within battle. No losing of any kind. This means I cannot black out train. Lastly, no using double team until the run seems absolutely hopeless. With every video, my routing and skills at Pokemon get better but I will still make plenty of mistakes. The comment section has been helping me tremendously, so keep on nitpicking. I have decided that since I do a few practice runs, keep watching for the what I learned section at the end of the video. Today's creator shout out is RBY Pokemon Challenges. He attempts to beat Pokemon Yellow at minimum battles, and get this, with zero DVs, the opposite of what I do. I like watching his channel every time he comes out with a new video. Here's a short clip of something from his channel that I absolutely loved against the rival what we are going to do is we are going to start by setting up double team and then we are going to use toxic then what we can do is use flash to actually reduce his accuracy you see evasion and accuracy are separate stats guys so evasion drops or evasion increases and accuracy drops work in tandem so here we take down magneton I am writing this script after the run. Please try and guess in the comment section how quickly I'll be able to beat the game and how well you think it'll do at certain points in the game. Like for instance, how quickly do you think I'll be able to beat Brock? Or maybe, what level do you think I'll be able to beat Brock at? Please make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay updated on future videos. First off, we're going to start the game by grabbing our level 5 Kangaskhan and replacing Charmander with the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to make sure that Champ has a Blastoise, but more importantly, doesn't have a Gyarados. I gave it the nickname Reptar because while I was thinking of nicknames, I got to thinking of Reptar. Take a look at these two images and tell me they don't look similar and make sure to pause the game and reset Reptar's stats to give it perfect DVs before starting. We start off our first champ battle with some comet punches leading to an easy victory. I start off the run heading to the optional rival battle. The battle is a complete mismatch at level 5. I have to rely a bit on luck for this one, but I need the early XP to save about 2 minutes in the run. Champ starts off with a Pidgey and 3 straight sand attacks. When all hope seems lost, we land our first Comet Punch and land it for a critical hit. We unfortunately don't take it out, but luckily the next one hits as well. We spot the Squirtle 5 Comet Punch misses and 20 HP. But Reptar is no pushover. We battle back with three straight connects with Comet Punch and take it down with only two HP to spare. I get some training done in Viridian Forest to level 12 and face the Light Years Trainer before Brock's gym to try and make it to level 13 quickly. That doesn't seem to happen and we have to face Brock at level 12. As you can probably imagine with a moveset like Comet Punch and Rage, the best I can do is just use up all the Comet Punches and just pray Rage carries me through the Onyx. The Geodude battle is a grueling one, but you get the chance to see how nice it is having a high HP and defense stat. By the time we make it to Onyx, we're only down to 35 HP, which is more than some Pokemon have for the entire Brock battle. However, we have one small problem. We're down to a measly two Comet Punches left. With our first, you can see we're doing next to nothing and the battle is probably lost. With our second and final Comet Punch, we manage a critical hit and we get close to the maximum amount of four hits. Now this is a manageable position to be in. Brock gets off a bide and we have no choice but to use Rage at this point. We get three Rages off and he only hits us for six damage. This one is going to be close. We manage to get four more Rages off, building our attack thanks in part to the Tackles and Screeches. This is when he finally uses Bide, and there's a good chance we may not get the damage we need. But thanks to the increased attack from Rage, 
we get two attacks off, and the bite attack was never in question. This earns us the Boulder Badge and gets us past the most difficult battle of the run up until the Elite Four. In Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the TMs for Water Gun and Mega Punch. We make our way to the Fossil Room, and I hear the magical Helix Fossil calling out to me. The call is an unusual one. Don't forget to teach Water Gun and Mega Punch, my friend. I do as the fossil requests, and then grab it. Next up, we make our way to the champ rematch, but he has no idea that we've hit the gym and learned Mega Punch early. The battle goes about how you'd expect. Bigiotto comes out and does its very best to shrug off a Mega Punch, but instead of using its overpowered sand attack, he just uses Gust, and we're off to the races. Abra doesn't know a damaging move, and Rattata has abysmal defenses. Squirtle does its very best to survive one Mega Punch, and only manages a Tail Whip, and we spot him another miss, as he only gets a meager bubble in before going down. I don't know if you guys were paying attention, but our HP is so high, and we have loads of PP left, so I decide to skip the heal and go straight for the Nugget Bridge Trainers with haste. None of them were particularly hard thanks to our stab normal moves, and even the Hiker wasn't an issue thanks to Water Gun. I was pretty confident going into the Misty Battle. The Staryu comes out, and one Mega Punch later, it goes down. Everyone knows Starmie is no slouch. First turn is an X Defend, and Mega Punch misses. This does scare me quite a bit. Second turn is a weak tackle, and a mega punch that's doing about a third. Third turn she hits us with a bubble beam. No, 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 stop, what's happening? Crit! Ouch. Now we're at her mercy for the next turn. Tackle, and a connecting mega punch gets us the win and keeps the zero reset train going. Next up, we go to the SSN to pick up our strongest move for the entire run. Hyper beam. Oh, my bad, I mean body slam. But with Stab, it's basically Hyper Beam with a chance of paralysis. Champ 3 is next, and with our new move, this is a piece of cake. Reptar makes his way to the battlefield, and Pidgeotto manages a single quick attack. But what's this? A Gen 1 miss, you say? Pidgeotto knows that its only way to get some damage in is to use another quick attack. So then it does, and we use our next body slam. Raticate and Kadabra go down to a single body slam each. War Turtle shows its bulk as it once again lives through our strongest move, but then goes down to the next body slam. We use our newly obtained cut and make our way to Surge. I don't think it's to anyone's surprise that Body Slam took out Voltorb and Pikachu in one hit each. Now Raichu on the other hand is a lot stronger, and with really low special, we could very much lose this if we don't one shot it. Body Slam then leaves Raichu on a sliver, but Classic Surge uses X speed. But with that improved speed, he gets to go next. Unfortunately for him, Growl doesn't manage to do any damage, and we take it out with our next attack. As we make our way through Rock Tunnel, I'd like to sidebar here, and while watching one of RBY's videos, I actually confirmed my suspicion from the previous video. I said that Rock Tunnel feels like the halfway point of the game. Now he has a battles left counter at the top of his video, since he does minimum battles for all of his videos. At the start of the game, he has a battle counter set at 66. At the end of Rock Tunnel, it's down to 32, so I guess I was right, technically. Next up, I make my way to the Celadon Mart to obtain Ice Beam and Rock Slide. I sell off some other items and purchase some protein. In my other practice runs, I would buy Calcium to boost our special, but unfortunately it wasn't helping me get the ranges I wanted at the Elite Four. I'm going to ignore Erica for now and head to Ghost Tower. Her Weeping Bell always crits on Razor Leaf, and that either one hit KOs us or leaves us at such a low level we cannot take another hit. Next up is Champ 4, and you could probably imagine that if the last one was so easy, this one will be even easier after all of those rock tunnel battles. Body Slam rips through Pidgeotto, Ralph, Execute, Kadabra, and almost Wartortle. An interesting thing to note here is that in this battle, the Raticate from his previous team is actually gone. There are a lot of theories around where the Raticate went, but my favorite is that he's just a good trainer and substituted it out. However, the leading theory is that it died, and that's the reason why he's at Ghost Tower. Not much else goes on at Ghost Tower, but next, I make my way to Silphco to grab one of the best moves in the game. I make sure to teach Earthquake right away. I decide to try my hand at Erica now that I have a few more levels under my belt. Victory Bell comes out, and I decide to use Body Slam. This may seem like a funny choice to many of you, because you know that Poison is weak to ground. However, from a previous video, I learned that ground resists rock, making Body Slam a much better move. Victory Bell uses Razor Leaf, and as expected, it did crit. But it's just not enough, as another Body Slam takes care of it. Tangela doesn't go down to a single hit, but we all know its moveset isn't all that threatening. Vile Plume is next, and it survives a Body Slam. We really don't want to see Petal Dance or Sleep Powder. It's Poison Dance, and that's the game.
While we make our way through Kanto, I want to sidebar with you guys about our new setup. I know that every video my setup looks a little bit different, but this time I made a lot of changes. You can probably tell that I made two angles on every box, as well as gave each box its own unique set of colors based on the Pokemon's picture. Next up, I changed the numbers and words font so that they would be thick enough to actually read, but still look natural. I also cleaned up the color scheme. Let me know if you guys like it. I think I'll be using this setup for quite a while, which will save me some time, and I'll be able to push out videos a little bit quicker. Koga is next, and I'm not entirely sure how this battle will go. Every run, I switched my approach with Koga, and this time is the lowest level attempt. The first coughing comes out, and I forget that it's not part grass type like Erica's Pokemon, and use a body slam. We then take a smog without being poisoned, and that takes us to Muck. I then correct my error and use Earthquake on Muck, and thanks to a Minimize, we get through Muck without taking any damage. Coughing is next, and Earthquake doesn't manage to take it out. Coughing makes the best of a bad situation, and manages a critical hit sludge, and probably taking us out of self-destruct survival range. We use an Earthquake, and it does about half. Deciding moment comes up, and it's toxic. Well, this should be an easy one. One more Earthquake, and the badge is ours. We make our way directly to Champ 5 because we already visited Silphco earlier to grab Earthquake. Pidgeot is out first and we choose a super effective Rock Slide. I'd like to say that Pidgeot is a bit more tanky than I expected, but then again, our level is actually lower than his. Ralph is an easy one-shot, fire types are weak to ground. Execute is next and one more body slam takes it out too, but that's probably because of the crit. Alakazam is an easy one-shot but only because we now have the badge boost from Koga that allows us to outspeed. Blastoise shouldn't be a problem in this battle. We have no good moveset against it, but it also doesn't have a good moveset against us. Just a few body slams to take it out. We make our way to Giovanni. We all know Nidorino is bad, especially since we learned that it doesn't actually have double kick. Kangaskhan tanks a body slam quite well. Let's just take a moment here to show you the difference between our Pokemon. Do these stats look like a Pokemon that's only three levels lower? The difference here is due to the stat XP that we've accumulated throughout the game. Every Pokemon you beat throughout your journey obtains you some stat XP and they eventually translate to statistics once in a while. It's a lot of the reason why many Pokemon seem to be able to race through the game after Misty. Anyways, the second Body Slam hits and gets us the knockout. A Bubble Beam takes out Rhyhorn. Nidoqueen is next, and its moves won't do much damage to us as we hit it with some Earthquakes to take care of it. 30 seconds later and we're already in front of Sabrina with high hopes. Kadabra and Mr. Mime are taken care of with one body slam each. Venomoth is surprisingly able to survive a body slam and retaliates with a stun powder. It goes first and just uses leech life before going down. Alakazam is next and we're in pretty good shape because we weren't going to outspeed it anyways. Alakazam starts off with a 17 damage side wave and now there's a really good chance at victory. The Alakazam then uses side beam next and crit. So much for our perfect run. The next attempt we make it to the Alakazam once again with 127 HP and without paralysis this time. Alakazam once again uses Psy Wave for a low amount of damage and we get our body slam off. However, looks like it was a range because we won this time. Now we make our way through Pokemon Mansion but not taking the time to grab the extra vitamins. The most important thing to grab is Blizzard and the rare candies. I decide to skip Blaine's trainers this time, going for speed and head directly to Blaine. I don't think anyone would be surprised that a high attack stat Pokemon that learns Earthquake is going to sweep through Blaine quite easily. Although, I do think Arcanine may have been because of a crit. Next, we fly directly to Giovanni at lightning pace as I'm making a record in real time. First out is Rhyhorn and we use Bubble Beam, and it goes down real easy. Dugtrio is a glass cannon, and my speed is high enough to get Earthquake off first. Thanks to Poison being weak to ground, and ground not resisting ground, the best move for Nidoqueen is Earthquake. Nidoqueen goes about the same way, but without any fighting or special moves, nothing is going to be very strong against us. Last is Rhydon, and unsurprisingly, it's just two Bubble Beams to take it down. At this point, I'm extremely excited, and I head directly to Champ 6 without healing and going to be low on Earthquakes for this one. Hopefully you guys didn't forget about Rock Slide, but we make good use of it against Pidgeot. Rhyhorn is always easy with a Bubble Beam. I was hoping not to waste my last Earthquake on Growlithe and attempted to use Rock Slide. At the time, I didn't realize that Rock is also double effective against Fire as well. Execute is pretty strong defensively and my best move is just to use Body Slam. The first one does about half, 
and he manages to seed me. I don't think that will help out very much. Alakazam is next, and unfortunately, I do not outspeed it, and it sets up Reflect covering for its greatest weakness. Our body slam does about a third, and this scares me tremendously. But a lucky paralysis gives me a bit of hope. Then, Alakazam gets fully paralyzed, and I luck my way through to Blastoise. Unfortunately for me, Blastoise is very bulky, and now it knows Hydro Pump. Our first body slam does about one-fourth, but also manages to get another lucky paralysis. Blastoise is then fully paralyzed, and we get another body slam in and this looks very winnable. Next turn, we get a critical hit body slam as he goes for withdraw, assuring our victory. Up to this point, we've done almost minimum battles for this run. Level 45 is lower than any of my test runs, and after a chat with Scott's thoughts, he recommended that I use all my rare candies at the start of the league. So I do just that, and we make our way to Lorelei at level 55. Dugong is out first, and we use our first rock slide and do a large amount of damage. She attempts a takedown and misses, giving us the opportunity for a two-turn knockout. Cloyster is out next, and we use our Thunderbolt, and she goes for a clamp. It hits three times for a lot of damage before we're able to finish it off with a Thunderbolt. Slowbro is generally quite consistent, as its only attacking move is Water Gun, and it doesn't use it very often. A few Thunderbolts later, and we work our way to Jinx. At first, I was using Earthquake, but I eventually learned Ice is weak to Rock, and I went with Rock Slide for an easy KO. The hardest Pokemon is next, and we need three Rock Slides to try and get by Lapras, and there's nothing I can really do to make this fight any better. Our first Rock Slide connects, and it's doing maybe a third, but she connects with a Hydro Pump. Next up is a Thunderbolt to test out the damage range, and it's about a third as well. A Blizzard is next, and it takes us out for the second reset of the run. On the very next attempt, we make it back to Lapras, but with a bit less HP than last time because of some Aurora Beams. Our first attack is a Rock Slide. Oh boy, a miss really puts us in bad shape. Hydro Pump? Oh good, another miss. I guess nothing really happened this turn. Our next rock slide lands, and it's a crit! Nice! This gets her to super potion range and allows us to use our next rock slide without having to take a high damage special attack. But we miss again and take a low damage body slam. Then the next one hits and we get ourselves the win. Let's not celebrate too much. I'll let live Steve take it away from here. I even need to save, it's Bruno. Oh, but I should have I should have healed. I should have healed, I should have healed, I should have healed. I should have healed, I should have healed, I should have healed. I should have healed, I should have healed, I should have healed. Yeah, I was supposed to heal. I didn't talk much after I knew what I did, but you got the point. Back to Lorelei. On the very next attempt, Lapras takes us out with a blizzard. The following attempt, we make it to Lapras, undamaged. We land a rock slide and she misses a blizzard. Another rock slide in a good range brings us back to the black belt. This time, I managed to teach Ice Beam over Thunderbolt. I also didn't even need to heal this time. The first Onyx is out and it just takes one Ice Beam to take it out. I test the waters on Hitmonchan with an Ice Beam because of its terrible special. Turns out, if you have bad special and they have bad special, it's not a lot of damage. Luckily, he just decides that he needs more defense and it goes down to the next Ice Beam. I then change up the strategy on Hitmonlee using a Body Slam, which in hindsight is the move I should have used on Hitmonchan as well. Onyx, once again, doesn't like Ice Beam. Machamp, however, takes a Body Slam like a champ and the Black Belt gets worried and he decides to increase his defense even further. Luckily, the next hit was a crit so the defense increase didn't matter at all. The Black Belt really tried his best, but unfortunately it just wasn't good enough. Agatha is next, and I make sure to heal and replenish my PP. Everyone probably knows that if you know Earthquake and have a decent attack stat, Agatha isn't usually much of a problem. The first Gengar doesn't outspeed and goes down in a single Earthquake. Golbat is next, and I get a Rock Slide in, and it takes damage, and then switches out to Haunter. Sure, I'll take out the Haunter with an Earthquake, no problem. Now it's time to finish off the Golbat that she threw right back in. Arbok doesn't like Earthquake thanks to its poison typing and bad defense. I am able to outspeed the Gengar and finish it off with an Earthquake. This had to be one of the easiest Agatha battles I've had in a really long time. Now it's time to teach Blizzard over Ice Beam to make sure that my attacks on the dragons do a little bit extra. Lance begins and Gyarados comes out first. I try out a Body Slam for the chance of paralysis. I get hit with a really 
solid hyper beam and battle back with a rock slide and a miss. Luckily, there's a recharge turn and rock slide finishes it off the next turn. Dragon Air is next and as I mentioned before, Blizzard doesn't do that much damage, so I went with the protein instead of calcium. I take hyper beam and finish it off the next turn. The next Dragon Air is out and body slam does just as much as Blizzard did. Then I take it out the very next turn. There's no way I'm going to outspeed the Aerodactyl and I'm just a sitting duck for whatever move he's going to decide to pick. He picks Hyper Beam, and it leads us to our next reset. On the very next attempt, I used Rock Slide on a full HP Gyarados to see how much damage it would do, and it does quite a bit. The Dragonairs go down to a mixture of Blizzard and Body Slam to bring us back to Aerodactyl. I go with the Rock Slide, and he fails the Supersonic. The next turn, we get hit with a strong takedown, but our next Rock Slide connects, bringing us to Dragonite. Dragonite is out next, and Blizzard takes it into Hyper Potion range. After an agility and a Hyper Beam miss, Dragonite is taken care of. Last up is Champ, the champion. I'm going to let the live footage explain the emotions behind this one. I managed to heal this time. Last time I forgot to heal before the champion. Yes, that was good. Yes, crit. Nice. Leer. Okay, Leer's not the worst. Nice crit, but I fell asleep. No, not like this. Not like this. No! No! <laughs> oh, it was so perfect! <laughs> yeah, a disappointing way to lose for sure. On the very next attempt, we make it right back to Executor, no problem. We land the Blizzard, no problem, doing about one-fourth, but he then lands another Hypnosis. We luckily wake up pretty quick, but we miss our next Blizzard. Our Blizzards eventually whittle him down, but not before chipping us enough times to take us to 64 HP. Blastoise is next, and it appears that Body Slam will be a 3-hit KO. I have to avoid Blizzard and Hydro Pump twice for the win. I don't like those odds. We take a critical hit bite, and the next turn is a Hydro Pump for the next loss. For the next attempt, I'll let Past Steve take over. No, stop talking to Lance! Oh, please, please, please. I need one uh, sub one hour. So that's like literally the worst thing that could happen, right? I miss Rock Slide. He hits Rock Slide. All right. And honestly, I should probably be saving the Blizzard for the, uh, the Executor. Wait. I thought Executor was before Arcanine. Alright, well we have a little bit extra power then. Thanks to the level up. Oh, a freeze! Nice. That's a lot more HP this time. And, oh yes. Yes, we got Paralysis! Yes! With that final body slam, we become the champion of the Pokemon League with only a single Kangaskhan. We finish the game at level 60 with 57 minutes real time, 332 game time, and 7 resets. Since I mentioned those other attempts so much, it's only fair that I mention how I did in those attempts. My first attempt, I finished at level 59 with 140 real time, 452 game time, and 26 resets. My second attempt, I finished at level 63 with one hour real time, 356 game time, and four resets. I did so well on my third run, I didn't even find a need to do a fourth run. I did get slightly better each time as I figured out better paths, better moves, and when not to pick things up. Kangaskhan is only my fifth Pokemon to complete the game with, 
and with a bit of experience under my belt, I can confidently say that it's one of the best Pokemon I've ever played with. Even though the numbers don't show it, I do think that Alakazam is still a bit better, but I think I may need to replay that run without rose-colored glasses. I'm going to stick it at the second spot of the S tier for now. Kangaskhan is a very strong Pokemon, and it was able to complete the game with the least amount of battles of any Pokemon I've done so far. But unlike Alakazam, it has struggles against Lorelei, Lance, and the champion, where some luck is required to get an extra attack in. Kangaskhan also has an embarrassment of riches when it comes to moves. I could go for Thunder, I could grab more Calcium to boost my special moves, there's a lot of things that I could do to make this run smoother at any point in the game. Thanks to the comments of my last video, I have chosen to do Electabuzz. This one had the most comments overall, and I have decided that it is next. Also, take note that I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of all of the comment selections, so your past comments are still in the running for future videos. If you have any suggestions for Pokemon, ways to improve my strategy, maybe even a way to improve my video quality, or just want to start a meme like Scott's Thoughts Chat Uses Dennis, Feel free to let me know in the comments section down below. My channel's always improving, and every video I plan to bring even better content. Keep the suggestions coming, and I look forward to bringing another video. If you've stayed past this point of the video, I thank you very much. At this point of the video, I'd like to go over some of the situations that led to this video's run looking so polished. There weren't a whole lot of problems to work out like there was with Beedrill. But, these are the ones that I could find. The following things I've learned from attempt number one. On Nugget Bridge, you will get to see the first example of a glitch I found. This glitch is that if you are hit with two or more sand attacks, Rage's accuracy will drop to actually zero. I'll bring up a miscounter here for the battle, but don't worry. I'll stick in some more examples of this in the future. I don't want to base this claim on nothing but my word. I taught Ice Beam very early on to get an advantage over Erica, but I didn't realize that Body Slam was just stronger than Ice Beam because of our low special. I sold Dig, but this wasn't really an improvement in my strategy, but I just wanted to point out that I make mistakes just like everyone else. I grabbed unnecessary vitamins and PP ups that didn't seem to affect the results of most situations. I did a lot of testing to see what level I could take Lorelei on, but these went out the window when I took all the rare candies at the start. But, just so you guys do know, at level 47, I took two resets because I simply couldn't get a high enough damage output to get through her. I tried again two more times at level 48 and still wasn't able to get through. At 50 and 51, I decided to make a change. A viewer in my Twitch chat suggested I switch to Rock Slide and at level 51, I lost five times in a row, but things were definitely going in a better direction. At level 52, I deemed her consistent enough to move on. Obviously not super consistent, as you saw in the actual run at level 55, I still lost to her a few times. On Agatha, Rock Slide was actually a range at the lower level of 54, but this wasn't an issue going further. With Lance, I did some testing at level 58, 59, and 56, and I realized there was nothing I could do to change the difficulty of this battle. Champ is where quite a few things happen. At level 57, I lost three times, and I was just gauging how much damage certain attacks would do. Like I figured out Thunderbolt was a three hit KO on Blastoise, just like Body Slam. This meant that I didn't actually need to keep it after Lorelei, freeing up a move slot. Then, I learned Earthquake was a range on the Alakazam at level 57, but keeping Body Slam instead of Thunderbolt would fix this issue. On attempt number two, I wanted to change a few things up, but not much. On the Rival 1A battle, on attempt number two, I encountered the Rage Glitch once again. I will once again bring up a miss counter so you can see just how bad this glitch really is. I can typically save nearly two minutes by battling Rival 1A. The Light Years Trainer was only able to hit me with one sand attack, making it possible to win with Rage, showing that the glitch is only happening when you get hit by two sand attacks. At level 30, I am within range of losing to Erica with a Victory Bell Razor Leaf and a Vile Plume Petal Dance. So, I need to either come back at a higher level or risk a bit of luck. In Ghost Tower, Bubble Beam isn't a move I can rely on against Ghastly, and I need to learn Rock Slide earlier. At level 58, Lorelei is consistent with Thunderbolt and Rock Slide, but you guys already knew that. At level 60, I still can't seem to one-shot Gyarados with Thunderbolt, or Blizzard a Dragonair but I was able to Blizzard Dragonite. From there, I decided that if I cut the trainers at Blaine's Gym, 
I can probably save a lot of time and not really change much of an outcome for the Elite Four. Well, that's it for the What I've Learned section for today. I hope that this slower, more detailed version is a bit better than the quick montage from the last video. Please let me know if you liked this quick What I Learned section. It's a bit quicker than the rest of the video, but I didn't want to leave anyone in the dark just how I learned these strategies. Thanks everybody, and I hope to see you guys in two weeks with Electabuzz. We want to rage, so that way uh, we can keep all of our Comet Punches for the next battle. Of course, ceremonial five misses on uh, sand true because of one sand attack makes sense. We didn't save. Like this was supposed to be a gimme battle. The events that happened. I kid you not. I might have missed twenty times on this sand true. And here it is. It's happening again. It's happening again. This move is 100% accurate. So, I mean... Oh my god, it's happening again. Do I really have to save in front of this guy next time? Come on, come on. Come on, Sand True. Please, do not Sand Attack me too much. No! No! It's happening! No, look! It's just... It's like... It's like a miss montage! Like, look at this! Look at this! It's a hundred percent accurate! What is going on? I have not hit a single rage! If- Look at this! Look at this! He- I must be minus six right now because he can't even sand attack me! He's used like 20 sand attacks! In a row! You know it would be spelled. Alright. No sand attack. Two sand attacks. All right. Well, we've officially uh, we're we're gonna miss, and our cheating run is gonna die. Apparently, two two sand attacks is uh, gets raged. I think I think I'm about to confirm it. Two sand attacks equals one zero percent accuracy. This has got to be a glitch. I must have I must have found a glitch.